This is Revelation, the Pictures of Comfort and Hope, Part 9. We're in the second vision of John. He's been called up into heaven, into God's throne room, seen God on the throne, surrounded by his rainbow and the heavenly creatures. These are the 24 presbyters and the four living creatures that we've seen in Ezekiel and Isaiah. Now we're exploring the Lamb and the scroll. First, the scroll is presented to John. John's been summoned to God's throne room as a reporter to write down what transpires there. We've seen that this throne room is actually a court setting, and God on the throne is bringing a proceeding against his unfaithful bride, the religious system of earthly Jerusalem. John is about to have revealed to him what the Jews and people everywhere have desired to know for thousands of years. Jesus said that the Pharisees had searched the scriptures to find out about salvation and about him. Paul said the prophets, saints, and even angels long to see how God's mystery unfolds and just what he is doing in redemptive history. Quoting Paul Blackham, the ancient church of the Old Testament was so eager to find out the time and circumstances of Jesus' death and resurrection because they knew that this was the key to explain all of history. Here in God's hand, says Paul Blackham, is the scroll that carries that answer, and no creature can open it. No angel or man, no wisdom or insight can peer inside. John is sorrowful because nobody can open it. And Blackham says that perhaps John is thinking that the church will be lost in the tribulation. But the 24 elders remind John that Jesus, the head of the church, is enthroned at the center of history. Blackham notes that the scroll is about the judgment God is bringing on the unbelievers and how he is saving his bride through Jesus. Quoting Blackham, the scroll contains the plans of the Father to bring judgment against the unbelieving world and to redeem his church, all through the Lord Jesus Christ, who has saved the church from that judgment through his death, resurrection, and ascension. As this study has followed Kenneth Gentry's thesis primarily, here we see that this covenant failing is the adultery of the unfaithful wife, and that the covenant judgment is, more specifically, a divorce judgment. Here are some of his arguments to this effect. There is mention in this section of earthly Jerusalem being the adulterous wife, and new Jerusalem, the church, being the pure bride of Paul's letters. These will be further demonstrated later in this course. To clarify, however, Gentry's position on the divorce is that the divorce is a symbolic image for God's judgment on Israel. It's not a literal divorce, but a dramatic symbol of how serious her judgment is. This is a clarification I got in a private email from Gentry. The divorce is symbolic, not legal, and not ceremonial. The following quotes are from his book, Navigating the Book of Revelation, and they address the symbolism of the divorce decree from which the judgments proceed. Upon questioning, he confirms that he sees this as the same scroll that is given to John to eat in Revelation 10, quoting, The divorce of Israel leads to enormous redemptive historical changes. The seven-sealed scroll in Revelation 5 is God's divorce decree against Israel, his Old Testament wife, so that he can, in Christ, take a new bride, the new Jerusalem, in Revelation 21 too. We see the scroll fully opened in Revelation 10, where it presents the inclusion of the Gentiles in God's kingdom. This fits the meaning of the mystery in Revelation 10:7, as Paul explains in Romans 16, 25 to 26. Those quotes are from his book, Navigating the Book of Revelation. This quote is from a short article on Gentry's website. The seven-sealed scroll in Revelation seems to represent a certificate of divorce handed down against Israel by the enthroned judge who is seen in Revelation 4. In scripture, marriages are based on a covenant contract, so that in biblical days the Jews wrote out divorce decrees. The following evidence suggests that the scroll in Revelation 6 is a bill of divorce. A deeper reading of Revelation strongly compels such a conclusion. First. Revelation emphasizes two particular women, who obviously correspond to one another as opposites, as positive and negative images. The wicked harlot, Revelation 17 and 18, and the pure bride of Christ, Revelation 21. They correspond to the earthly Jerusalem, the place of Christ's crucifixion, Revelation 11, 8, and the heavenly Jerusalem, which is holy, Revelation 21, 10. Revelation's drama presents the revelation and execution of the legal judgment, Revelation 15 and Revelation 16, on the fornicating harlot, Revelation 17 through 19, and the coming of a virginal bride, Revelation 21. This bride takes the harlot's place after a marriage supper. 
Revelation 19. Philip Carrington explains, quote, the harlot has disappeared. The bride is taking her place. It is impossible any longer to maintain that the harlot means Rome. The antithesis must lie between the old Israel and the new, the false Israel and the true, the Israel that is to appear so soon as the new Jerusalem. This is from Carrington, the meaning of Revelation, as quoted by Gentry. Second, the Old Testament background for this image derives from Ezekiel, John's main source. Israel's judgment appears in Ezekiel 2, 9 to 10, as written on a scroll on the front and back. This corresponds perfectly with Revelation 5, 1. In Ezekiel 2 to 9, the prophet outlines Jerusalem's devastation, which corresponds with Revelation 6 and so on. In Ezekiel 16, the prophet presents Israel as God's covenant wife, who becomes a harlot. You can see this also in Jeremiah 3, 1 to 8, and Isaiah 50. Third, following the divorce and the judgments flowing from it, John sees a new bride coming out of heaven, Revelation 21 and 22. In Revelation's drama, God does not take his new bride until he legally judges his current harlotrous wife. This fits well with Paul's allegory in Galatians 4, wherein one wife is cast out, Hagar, who represents the Jerusalem below, and another is taken, Sarah, who represents the Jerusalem above. This is all from an article on Gentry's website, Postmillennial Worldview. It's called Revelation Scroll, God's Divorce Decree. The Lamb Who Was Slain Nobody in heaven has the authority to open the scroll with the seven seals. And because of this, John weeps and weeps. Paul Blackham sees this as the record of unfolding history. But Gentry has established in this courtroom setting as the divorce decree. Who can open it and enact its judgments? In Perry Mason fashion, the ultimate witness is called. John is alerted to the presence of the Lion of Judah, and once again he turns to see what he has heard. Instead of the expected image of the Lion, though, he sees standing there a lamb who has been slain. Paul Blackham, like Han Canegraaff, finds the different views of Jesus here as being hermeneutically significant. Blackham says, quote, We are taught a key lesson about interpreting the book of Revelation in verses 5 and 6. John first is directed to a triumphant lion who might conquer with savagery and power. But when John turns and looks, verse 6, the lion's true nature is now seen as a lamb that has been slain. The book of Revelation constantly offers us different images for seeing the same reality, each perspective capturing a vital facet of the truth, end quote. The hermeneutical implications of this technique come into play later when we interpret such images as the 144,000 and the great multitude. The idea being that John hears a sound or is told to look for something, and when he turns to do so, the appearance is not what he had expected, though the object is the same. In the courtroom, Jesus is the ultimate witness of the crime because he is the aggrieved party. He's the one they have killed, but he has come back to life and has conquered by his blood. He has returned to testify against his killers and to bring their judgment. He is vindicated and glorified by his resurrection and he ascended to the throne as king and judge. Romans 12, citing the Old Testament, has reminded the New Testament believer that vengeance indeed belongs to the Lord. In relation to the law of Moses, we are used to hearing about Jesus the Passover lamb, and even Jesus the kinsman redeemer. But here he is Jesus the avenger of blood. In the Old Testament, both the kinsman redeemer and the avenger of blood are close kin to an aggrieved party. And Jesus is kin to those whom he is redeeming, as well as to the victim that he is avenging. In the Old Testament, when you flee the avenger, he pursues you and exacts God's vengeance on you. There is no mercy for the murderer in the law of Moses. The manslayer has defiled the land and cannot be ransomed. Nor will idolatrous Israel be ransomed this time around. This time it is the redemption, not the judgment, which will pass them over. There's a provision in the law for the perpetrator of an accidental killing by which he may flee to an appointed sanctuary city where he will be safe from the avenger. But he has to stay in that city in exile until the death of the high priest of that time. Since Jesus's ascension, Hebrews tells us that we have a great and eternal high priest in heaven. He will never die and the judgment that he exercises will never end. He is avenging the blood of the prophets and of all the righteous dead that has come upon Jerusalem, the blood of the martyrs and his own blood. Jerusalem was often accused by the prophets of bearing this blood guilt. 
In fact, the Pharisees themselves declared that his blood was on their own hands and on the hands of their children when Pilate washed his hands of it. Of Jesus' triumph and glorification as king, Blackham offers, quote, It is vital to see that Jesus is reigning in heaven right now. The cross and resurrection of Jesus give him the full authority to reign in the highest heaven over the entire creation. The ascension of Jesus is the enthronement of Jesus. It is a bad mistake to imagine that Jesus will only reign at some time in the future after his return. No, all the way through Revelation, the central message of the whole book is that the Lord Jesus Christ is reigning over the creation right now in both judgment and redemption. The Seven Seal Judgment As Jesus breaks the seals and opens the scroll in Revelation 6, a familiar six and one pattern emerges. He opens six of the seals, then there's a pause for the sealing of the 144,000, and then he opens the seventh seal. This pattern is repeated when we hear the seven trumpets, beginning in Revelation 8. Paul Blackham points out that this is the pattern of creation, also reflected in our weekly calendar of six workdays, followed by a seventh, the blessed day or the weekly Sabbath. We see the pattern when Joshua entered Canaan and destroyed Jericho. He marched around the city once a day for six days, and then seven times on the seventh day. On that seventh day, he blew the trumpet seven times, as in Revelation, and the city fell flat. The fact that the city fell flat reminds us of Jesus' prophecy concerning Jerusalem in the Olivet Discourse, that not one stone would remain on another. First, there are seven trumpets sounding, and then the city falls flat. There are six days of marching, and then a distinct seventh. In Revelation, there are six trumpets sounded, a pause interrupts, and then the seventh trumpet brings the destruction of Jerusalem. The second connection is that Jesus' prediction about Jerusalem falling flat, like Jericho, is fulfilled in Revelation after the completion of the same six and one patterns. I've never heard the two connected by other teachers, but this is the same pattern that we see in the libation ceremony in the Festival of Tabernacles. For six days, the priest carries water from the Pool of Siloam, and he pours it out with wine on the temple altar. On the seventh day, he does this seven times. In John chapter 7, this is when Jesus, the true tabernacle of God, stands up in the temple and announces that he is the one from whom the living water, the Holy Spirit, flows. He's recognized in this celebration of God's provision to Moses in the wilderness as the Messiah of God, the Mosaic priest, and the Davidic king. As Paul Blackham draws our attention to this six and one pattern in creation, he teaches that this can also be seen as the rolling back of creation. There are four cycles of this pattern listed, and four is also the number related to creation. We noted before that much of the language of the Exodus judgment also demonstrates a similar reversal of creation, the language of uncreation. This language is picked up at Mount Sinai, and it's used throughout the Bible for judgment, rescue descriptions. The flashback to creation also involves the same six and one pattern as mentioned before. Blackham teaches that when the six seals and the six trumpets and the six vials culminate in the seventh, this signifies the perfect number of God's complete judgment. Each cycle represents, in his view, all of the time period between Christ's ascension and his second coming. As with the lion and lamb viewing, they are the same events of history viewed from different perspectives and each one of these cycles culminates in the final earthquake and destruction of the city. This is the climactic new creation, the ultimate rest or Sabbath. This is from Blackham's book by book study. There's much in this view that I like and that I've taken for granted over the years, but Kenneth Gentry sees the seals, trumpets, and vials as culminating instead in the AD 70 destruction of Jerusalem. As we've said before, we have to be careful and humble in interpreting Revelation. I can't adjudicate between these two different interpretations, but I do appreciate and I even prefer Gentry's view in some ways. It keeps intact the timestamps of Revelation, the ones that say things must come soon and are very near. I'm also very impressed when I see evidence that these prophecies have been minutely fulfilled in history already. As we've seen in previous lessons, several of the ancients believed they had been fulfilled. In Gentry's view, the seven seals show the judgment on Israel as it begins. For one, we can't avoid the similarity to the scroll in Ezekiel, where Ezekiel seems to have seen the same four angelic creatures and God's throne surrounded by the same rainbow 
that John is witnessing here. In Ezekiel 2, he's commissioned, like John has been in Revelation, and given a scroll written on both sides, as John is. This Ezekiel scroll teaches about the judgment to come upon Israel during the Babylonian exile. It's a not far future judgment at the end of history, but one immediately coming upon them. In Revelation, we ought to have the same type of judgment in mind, and the fact that it is near and coming soon should point us to the first century. For this reason, it's natural to see that this is the first phase of the Jewish wars with the Romans, and the first attack and the shaking of the great city. The pause in Revelation 7, occurring between the opening of the sixth and the seventh seals, indicates the pause in history when the Roman civil wars, after the death of Nero, caused the armies of General Vespasian to withdraw from Jerusalem for a time. This pause in the attack allowed the Christians following Jesus' warning to flee to Pella. In either interpretation, either Blackham's or the Gentry interpretation, the whole judgment is brought about by Christ for both redemptive and judicial purposes. Jesus is in charge of history, and it's by his action that these events have come to pass.